both the architect or an engineer. Uh, what are you? I'm a recruiter for mechanical. Okay, mechanical. Okay. So what, what's your background? Uh, okay, good. Excellent. Academia. Love it. All right. So let me turn this over to Nico. Great. And, uh, yeah, take it away. Thank you, Andre. Really appreciate the intro, and I appreciate everything that you've done to set this up. And to John as well, and Hefefe for, Hefele for uh, allowing us to speak here. Thank you all for coming. I've met most of you. I've missed a couple, but I'm sure during the demo session we'll uh, get around to meeting each other. Um, my name is Nick Scarfo. I'm with Ceramia Associates. We're an acoustical and technology consulting company, which means we help architects and other clients make decisions on those two fields. My specialty is in acoustics. My background is in signal processing, so I started as an electrical engineer. I was also developing games, and then somehow those two got combined and I became a VR developer for sound. Basically, the gist, the gist of what I'm going to tell you about today is our acoustical virtual reality platform, which is an in-house uh, solution to, for, for, for communicating to our clients, basically, our acoustical recommendations. It's not a Revit plugin in that you can use it to simulate sound and find out these things on your own. And for reasons that we'll get into, it's really good to have it alongside acousticians rather than instead of. Uh, maybe one day computers will become so strong that we'll be able to simulate every little particle, every wave of sound so accurately that I'll have made my own job irrelevant. But thankfully, that's not the case just yet. I'm going to start off with a quote. We want to see the newest things. That is because we want to see the future, even if only momentarily. This is a moment in which, even if we don't completely understand what we have glimpsed, we are nonetheless touched by it. This is what we have come to call art. That's from an artist that inspires me. And this also applies to Revit and to simulation. People are so excited by the idea of being able to see the future. And that's sort of what brought me into simulation. And into video games also, it was sort of a reality where I could embody a character and move around in a space. It was just mind blowing. It's sort of like Future Sight, or it's, it's sort of like a parallel world. And one thing that I want to talk about is the sort of hype that VR has accumulated and the, the, the BS alarms that go off with a lot of architects and engineers who are like, well, my company does VR. Like, I kind of understand where it's a little iffy and where it's not as practical as it presents itself to be. Um, I really want to, to get across that we feel we found a place where VR can really have a permanent home, and that even now we're able to use on projects in an effective way. And that's really exciting for us because you know, a lot of VR is this, this promise of a future where if computers were just twice as strong, if it looked just a little bit better, it would be really practical. Or you, know, you have augmented reality where there's this idea that you can seamlessly integrate VR with your own life, and that hasn't happened yet. You know, the straps, as you'll, as you'll see in the demo, it's a little bit of a mess to go into VR, and it's not exactly uh, comfortable. Uh, thankfully, sound is much more easy to simulate, in part because humans are visual creatures, and we're a lot more sensitive to visual phenomena. So I guess what I mean to say is that we feel like we've gotten sound pretty good, especially when we are working to really fine tune the simulation so that it matches our calculations, that's when we can really start to say that we have something accurate. I want to start off just for, you probably know this if you're into engineering and design, but what is virtual reality? Well, first of all, what is a 3D camera? It's exactly like a normal camera. Instead of a grid of sensors, it has a grid of virtual sensors. It, it, you can see it, it sort of casts a line onto an object, and lighting is involved too. But in general, we will ask each pixel what color it is on each frame. What is VR? Simply, it's two of those. It's really humble in, in, in what it actually is. And it's really marketed to be this momentous thing. But I see it as more of an extension of the technology that we already use. It also utilizes head tracking. That's the other major component. Um, in order to not get motion sick, you can't move people's heads in virtual space without them having to move their heads in real space. Um, 
Thankfully, because it's architecture and not roller coaster design, we can avoid doing that pretty well. So spatial audio is really, I guess, what my field is. Um, it's at the particular intersection of sound simulation and virtual reality. It's basically like the sound component of virtual reality. In the same way that adding a second camera will give you a 3D effect, uh, what we call a 3D effect, or the perception of a real space, your ears do that too. You have two ears. For instance, if there is, if a snap happens to my right, that sound is perceived by my right ear and then by my left, and the spatialization that occurs in my head happens because of that different difference in interval, among other things. So we can simulate two virtual ears, and that's what spatial audio is. Now, if there's a guitar playing here, if I turn my head, that guitar is gonna stay put in that virtual space. If I have headphones on and I'm listening to a song with the guitar on the right channel, and I turn my head, that guitar turns with me. And what, because we were born, not, not, I'm sorry, because we were raised listening to music on headphones or, or at some point you got used to this, you don't feel any sort of dis disconnect from reality when you hear that. But really that's not a real effect. Like it doesn't make any sense for the guitar to move with you. If the guitar stays put as it does in VR, your brain is tricked into thinking that it's a real guitar in a way that is uh, sort of subconscious. I think that sound is a lot less noticeable to people than, than visuals, like I said before. And uh, I grew up listening to records that some of them, Radiohead in particular comes to mind, just sounded special. I didn't, I, I'm like, this is produced well, but I didn't know anything about mixing. I assumed maybe it's mixed really well. Well, really it was recorded with binaural microphones. You see one on the left, it's the left, right? Yes. Um, if you record with a binaural microphone, you're basically able to get that effect. As long as the person doesn't move their head, they're going to be transported into some sonic world. And it really does work this way. I don't know if, any, if anyone here has uh, done the, the hairdresser simulation. It's kind of a common sound thing. If you haven't, check it out. It's, it's, so a bar, uh, an actor who's playing a barber cuts hair near a binaural microphone. And it feels eerily like you're getting your hair cut. Most people are very like, sort of taken aback by it. Um, some recent headlines have not been so optimistic for VR. And like I said before, I just wanna say that I think architecture is a place where it's not gonna go anywhere. Um, I joined, or I, I guess this project sort of came to be early 2017, a real high point for optimism uh, regarding VR and I connected to, to Bitcoin as well. Everyone is just so hopeful about computers. And I think now we're kind of starting to realize with a couple of these things that they're not exactly uh, as easy as we think. So this is where I come into the picture, the weird uncle. And I use that analogy, the weird uncle at Thanksgiving. That's what our CEO calls acousticians when it comes to the design process. We are there at the table, but are you, can you really say that the acousticians are central to the design of a building? Usually that's not the case, it depends on the space. But that nonetheless, we're super important for flagging when there's going to be a problem. Because when there's a noise problem, it's extremely distracting to whatever else you have going on. Um, and I compare this, the reason there's two of me is because really like VR is also sort of a, a strange field. And what's what I hope is interesting about this talk is that it's the combination of two strange fields that has created something really practical, I think. So why do acoustical VR? The sommelier says the wine is full bodied. People use words to communicate subjective feelings. Sound does not exactly have corollaries. What I mean to say is, I don't know if you know the term NC, NC40. This building is rated NC40. It means that sound fits a certain curve. If you see those on the left, the NC curves are the vertically stacked uh, lines. But the thing about it is you can have three different subjective experiences attached to, that, that, that share one NC number. That is to say that NC does not communicate everything, especially when you're talking about a subjective experience. All three of those curves are NC40, but one of them is perceived as a rumbling, one is a hiss, and one is just sort of like a normal HVAC spectrum. Um, there's really not enough, num you, you could add more numbers, but we found that it's better to just take people in. 
So we have a sound booth at Cerami, and really the ideal oralization setting is sort of like a music studio where there's all the noise is taken out. We have perfect control over all the levels and so on. We can just say when the, the microwave goes off, stuff like that. I can't do that here. Um, and something strange about the sound booth is that you completely remove context from sound. I have a picture of the street. So in one example that I'll, I'll go into later, we, we play street noise for people. We play it at the decibel level that it is outside. Um, people say this is way too loud. They say, this hurts my ears, please turn it off. And they were just outside where it was just as loud with the same noises. Your brain knows you're outside out in the city street and just expects loud noise. I'm sure that you have the experience of, you know, even with your, your iPhone or, or Android, uh, volume level, different volumes seem to be different loudnesses based on your context. Um, sound is like that, and that's one of the reasons why it's complicated to, to bring it up. So, as Rami saying goes, you don't know you have a noise problem until you have a noise problem, and then you have a noise problem. That's why we've targeted the design phase with this as, as far as VR goes. You could scan real spaces and simulate sound in them, but why? They already exist. We know how to solve those kinds of problems. As a side note, um, my other main project at Cerami is long-term monitoring kits. So if you do happen to not consider sound properly and you have a noise issue, uh, we can also help with that. So call us, don't, don't not call us if you've already built it and it's bad, that's, that's what we're here for. Um, oralization has existed for a long time and has been useful to acquisitions for a very long time. In particular, um, software like Odeon and Catacoustic, shown on the left, which produce heat maps. Like I said, these communicate ideas. If, if you're talking about a concert hall, that's something where the sound is super primary and really key to the design process. So having images, having ways to talk about and relay these ideas is, is really critical. Um, that's one part of it is simulating the sound, which I'll get into on maybe the next slide. Ambisonics is, has to do with the playback of those sounds. Um, you can use as big of a, you can, it's sort of like surround sound on steroids if surround sound could take steroids. Um, the idea is that if you want a sound to come from this space, you can make it come from that space out of that speaker. On headphones, you have a different set of problems because you have to deal with what's called people's head-related transfer functions. So in addition to sound being contextual, location-wise, experience-wise, it's subjective, it's also really based on the shape of your ears and head. In particular, in VR, people localize sound based on the way, like if something is behind you or in front of you, how do you know the difference? Because, I mean, on the right, if, if something's on my right, like I said, it hits my right ear at first, but front and back, how do you know? It actually is just the filter applied by your cartilage in your ear and the shape. And so it's different for everybody. This makes playback really complicated, especially over headphones where you have to pre-predict people's HRTFs, um, which is why I go through the trouble of getting a, a huge array of speakers this way if something is coming from behind you, you just play it from behind them. It's way simpler. So since a lot of you have engineering backgrounds, I wanted to talk about, it might interest you, how does oralization work? How do we predict what a sound is like? And how can we say with any confidence what the future will hold? How do, how do we read the future? Um, one common tool among acquisitions is the balloon. It makes an, a sound that's a lot like an impulse response. It's sort of like a... You hear the, the flutter? So you hear, and then you're hearing it bounce back and forth off the, the ceiling and the ground, usually, um, in a room like this. So do you see the visual comparison? You get like sort of a, I don't know if reverb is a term that everyone uses. I'm, I'm from a music background, but you get a reverberation and echo. The difference between a reverberation and echo is whether you have discrete uh, sounds, like whether it's perceived as like echo, echo, echo or just like a smooth sort of trail like that image. Anyway, um, in the virtual space, we pop a balloon. We send rays, just like light rays, all around the room to gather information about the materials and the geometry of the space. Use, we, then the end result is that impulse response. 
what's magical to me, I came from an electrical engineering background and convolution was my least favorite uh, mathematical operation. I could not see the use of, the use of it. But what's really strange is if you have the impulse response, you can simulate any sound very accurately in that room. So this is used in a lot of uh, music production. You can sort of capture the acoustic essence or, or footprint of a space and then play things back in it later. And it's pretty, it's as far as uh, playback media goes, it, it, it's really predictive. Uh, one particular instance that we used oralization was for the MoMA extension where they have this performance hall and street noise is right outside. They proposed a facade through which you would hear a great deal of street noise, especially when there's a siren. We're especially concerned in acoustics with the worst case scenario. You know, uh, you have a very quiet moment in a piece of music and then the, the fire truck goes by. We gave our client that experience and told them that, well, the facade that you want to build is going to sound bad and that's going to be a big problem for you. But they're architects and they're making decisions based on money and they have to weigh that subjective experience versus the dollar value. Um, because of the oralization, what usually takes months of going back and forth could take a moment for some for a decision maker. At the Comcast Center, um, an interesting case of oralization occurred. Uh, we were talking about treating the ceilings in these atrium spaces. And it's expensive to do that. They didn't want to do it for everything, but once we showed them the difference between what it sounded like they decided, well, we're going to treat three of the eight of the atriums, and then we'll programmatically work around this. So that's a pretty sophisticated decision that they knew they had to make, and they probably they probably wouldn't have treated it if they hadn't heard it, I like to think. Um, and I like to think that acoustic prediction can really not, not just get us a, a bigger seat at the table, so to speak, but but just make it a lot more seamless when we in, when we are integrating with other uh, people, which is why Revit and BIM are so exciting, because we would like for this to be really integrated with the whole process. We want everyone to be able to easily hear. Okay, then why hire an acoustician? This is a picture of a snapping turtle. Uh, I use it as an analogy or a metaphor. So it's a 3D rendering. Is it really a turtle? No. And when people ask, well, is your program accurate? It's like, well, like, is this an accurate thing of a turtle? Like, it doesn't tell you that if you put your finger near its mouth, it's going to bite your finger. That's the sort of thing that we're here to do. So I'm not creating a, a virtual reality simulator in order to replace our advice. It's, it's purely a communicative tool. It's, in, it's in-house. That's why I want to communicate. Um, that being said, I do want to walk you through, if you are interested, how you might participate in something like this. What kind of tools do I use? I can't obviously spill the beans on, I can't spill the beans on the secret sauce, so to speak. Um, but I can let you into some starting points for creating basic oralizations. Uh, one of the interesting things about acoustics is that a lot of acoustic phenomena sort of scale with size, which is really helpful for architects because like you're not going to have in Revit every little detail. You're not going to have every petal of that flower, but every petal of that flower does not influence the acoustic profile of the room. It's more, you know, the, the large scale geometry. And these are the things that we're able to do really well with raycasting. Um, I skipped a little bit back a couple slides back when I talked about the software arrives at that impulse response. And in case you're curious, the way that it does it is, uh, usually ray casting. Are you guys familiar with ray casting as far as uh, visuals are concerned? Okay, so in 3D rendering and, and, and in graphics, you have the virtual camera, and usually that, that fires through those pixels and arrives at the object. But as computers have gotten super strong, like that one over there, you have these graphics cards that are able to process many, many operations at once in parallel. And this allows us to do what's called ray casting. Instead of thinking about it from the camera's perspective, we think about traveling light. It's basically like photon simulation. The light emits virtual rays that bounce around 
And if they hit a curved piece of glass, it's super simple for them to curve with the glass. They are affected by uh, physical phenomena that are, are really complicated otherwise, but it's an expensive computation. This is what inspired me to do the whole thing is the way that ray casting is done in, in 3D uh, situations. I didn't know when I, when I arrived at Cerami, it wasn't for an interview, but they were talking about how they wanted to do this. And I said, oh, you should try ray casting. And they're like, what? And I'm like, yeah, I make video games and sometimes I do this. And then one thing led to another and here I am. It's, it's kind of crazy. Uh, the, mo the most recent graphics card uh, called the, the, the high-end one consumer graphics card is the Intel 2080 Ti. It was announced like a month ago and they, the brand name is now RTX for ray tracing. Ray tracing is going to be a huge technology that as far as simulation goes is going to increase perceived accuracy a huge amount. Um, if you look down the center column, I, I should have labeled these columns. I wanted to make it more exciting, but I'm going to spend a good deal on this, a good deal of time on this slide, just giving you a layout of the, the scene, so to speak. Uh, the center column, those are your plugins. Those are the ray casting engines. And you notice there, you have cat. That's sort of the uh, stray dog of the three. The, the resonance audio is by Google, Steam audio is by Valve, and Rift audio is by Facebook. I'm not going to make a plugin to compete with those tech giants. There are people on the case, so to speak. And you know, when I first arrived at Cerami, I think there was some expectation that I would do that. But as it's evolved, it's sort of been about applying those technologies as they come out rather than developing them ourselves. That being said, spatial audio in general is not designed for acoustics. It's for things like gaming, uh, immersive experiences. They want, when you drive through the tunnel, they want you to hear like basically a low pass filter. They want it to sound different. They don't care that it sounds accurate to the type of material in the tunnel. They might not have even specified what it is. And that's reasonable, but there's not really anyone concerned with acoustic problems in architecture and how it pertains to these simulations. This is a sort of balancing act, a dark art of, of the switchboard and, and of mixing. Uh, we, we make sure to communicate when, with our clients when we're doing that and what we're trying to do when we do this. The, the cats, which are not real time, so the heat map that I showed you before, those are more predictive. Those are more, this is what it's going to sound like, and we have a program that will tell you that. So there's that too, uh, spatial, immersive, predictive audio contains all these things. Um, I want to focus in particular on one route through this. The, I don't know if you can tell, but on the left side you have, how do you get your 3D model? The next is, what game engine do you use? Next, what ray casting engine? And then once you have the impulse response, how are you using it? And then finally, how do you play it back? Um, things to note are, I could go through each one. I don't know how much interest there is, but uh, in general, I'll go through why I've chosen each one for this particular one. A lot of it is so that I can run on this laptop. Uh, Revit, it's the Revit user, user group. Um, Unity, this is the platform of choice for VR right now. Unreal is usually associated with like a higher graphical fidelity, and uh, VR needs super low, low polygon count, not a lot of complicated lights. Keep things simple so that you can run at a high frame rate and not make, not make people sick. If you run at a choppy frame rate, that's what makes people want to throw up. I, I've forced myself through a lot of VR experiences that I that I've needed to take breaks for. Um, real time versus baked is interesting. When you have that impulse response, you have there's there's two locations you want to know in directions. You have the source and you have the listener, and there. Are, positions, directivities, and rotations. These just spaces in the room. That makes things complicated. A room doesn't really have an objective acoustic profile. It's all relative to the positionings. Um, 
But what you can do is calculate a grid of these points, get those exact, and then interpolate between them. So if I'm halfway between point A and point B, you sort of mix those two. And you end up getting a pretty re realistic uh, Being a finished product to an event like this, not yet. I haven't had uh, the billable hours to create like a really a, a real demo that I'm extremely proud of. So, rather than do that, I figured you guys would get more enjoyment out of uh, walking through how to make a really basic scene, and that way you can run on my laptop. And if it comes to uh, how many of you have VR in your office, I should have asked that before. And the rest of you, have you done VR in architecture? in any context? Okay. I feel like a lot of our clients are, are usually familiar with what to expect out of VR as far as like what, um, what, what to expect out of the finishes especially. Architects are designers and everyone is really concerned about all the little details that make up the building and that's, one of the, that's been one of the challenges for me. So I've simplified and removed a lot of the texture and detail in order to in, in a lot of my simulations, in order to not distract. Um, because if a chair isn't perfect, or if the carpet isn't the color that they think it is, that is gonna take away from the message that I'm trying to communicate. The notion of distraction is also an interesting one for my job because people say, one of the criticisms of, of my project has been, well, VR is like this new technology, it's crazy to be in the headset, it's really distracting me from the audio. Like, this is counterproductive because, you know, how am I supposed to focus on the, imp the echo when I'm like in a completely different world for the first time? And that, that's reasonable, that's a reasonable uh, objection. But my response to that is that that distraction is a similar level of distraction to if you're in the space for real. Like if you're in the built environment, you're not going to be honed in on the sound. You wanna give a distraction equivalent to whatever it is that they're doing in that space. Does that make sense? That's how I justify it. Um, when it comes to dealing with Revit in particular, um, FBX is usually the, the middle ground. If you want photorealism, if you want it to look like real life and you're presenting to an end client trying to sell them a space, for instance, then you're gonna wanna go through Max. You're gonna want those materials to look real. And you can do that, that's just not what I do. I take the FBX, I just want the shapes, and what I do to each and every uh, piece of the building is I assign it an acoustic material. And so when sound bounces off a wall, it transmits and it also bounces off. Those, it's, it's really that simple of a science usually. Um, there's resonance and stuff like that. There's, it diffracts over corners, but those first two things are really key. Every material is going to bounce every frequency a little bit differently. If you're familiar with the concept or the notion of filters, every wall applies a filter to the sound. By the time it reaches your ear, it's hit a certain number of filters and it's gonna sound different. That's basically what this oralization is all about. Predicting those bounces so that you can predict the sound. That is to say, out of Revit, usually I just expect the geometry in the form of FBS, but you can do visuals too. I talked about a little bit about the uh, position of the sources. This can handle a lot of different, I, I've, I've done as many as 50 at a time, but usually I try to keep it lower. Uh, what's really cool is that in a scene like this, if they were in a space, um, there's two ways to make crowd noise. Some people take a crowd noise off the internet and just put it, if they oralize it, by putting it to the correct levels. But what I do is every individual conversation is happening and being simulated and adding up to this some sound of a crowd noise. It's the first time that I heard it, I, I couldn't believe that the computer was able to handle it. And I had doubts to its accuracy, but it, when it's calibrated, that, we, that, that is less of a concern. And I do wanna talk about calibration a little bit. Uh, an acoustics toolkit primarily consists of uh, a sound level meter. So this super accurately reads each band, each frequency of sound. So in our, our, our 
engineers will calculate what each band is predicted to be. So you can tweak, you can apply a filter over the whole thing to have them match, is the idea. So let's take these sources and put them in a simple office. For the sake of this demonstration, each material has a different color, so you can sort of get a feeling for what it is. You have green is wood, uh, blue is sort of like a gypsum hard rock shape. These are, these are super basic. This is something I whipped up very recently in order to for this demonstration. Um, on the left, something interesting is the directivity. Uh, that mesh represents how sound is projected forward out of that speaking person. And when I turn like this, things sound different just because I'm not facing it. That just sort of has to do with like the amount of energy you're projecting. Then you go to Raycast, and this is purely a number crunching thing. Uh, an important distinction is baked versus real time. We're doing real time today. Baked is a lot more accurate, but is you have to account for every choice that they're going to make in advance, so it's a lot more complicated. But with a client, it's certainly feasible. It's what we usually do. We, we pre-bake the options that we want to present and then present a more accurate model. But this, I kind of just want to show off spatial audio. Um, and that's basically it. This is what you get to. The thing that those stock photo people were missing is headphones. Uh, VR itself is going to be improved drastically by the addition of spatial audio. And I feel like I've sort of gotten a sneak peek into that future by being extra concerned about sound right now, where not a lot of the big companies are. Um, so I definitely think that once visuals have gotten to a sophisticated enough point, then people are really going to start to care about sound. And, and even things like music will improve. I, I honestly have wondered whether I want that guitar to stay where it is, just on my headphones. Uh, what does that mean? What is VR music? Would that be something that, would, wouldn't more real music be good? Um, and that's a snapping turtle on the bottom right. Thank you. Yes, unfortunately, we had a little bit of, uh, who's the guy with the mistakes? Murphy's Law. He, he just affected me then also. Uh, we have one, one headset, but that should be enough with the time that we have. We can also uh, talk about questions and stuff like that. Thank you all for listening. It's been an honor. I'm, I, I, I think I'm, I must be pretty young for a speaker here, so just to have your ear has been, has been really, I'm, I'm grateful. What questions do you guys have? There's one I can see. Oh, no, right, yeah, yeah, right here. Yeah. You were just thinking about a question. Well, I'll get it then, so give me a second. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, don't worry, let's get, get started. Let's get started, right? Sure. Get started. All right, well, we got to have the music back on or something. We got to break the ice, you know? We got to, I feel like I'm in presentation mode, so I'll take my jacket off. <laughs> take the jacket off. All right, off. I, 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 the, the goodbye to the, the, the WebEx um, people. Thank you. To, to all the people online and on the recording, thank yes. you for being here. Um, we're going in.